Welcome to the Designated Drinker Show, the podcast that's raising the bar on craft cocktails. I am your host, Louise Solison. With me, as always, is my very, very talented friend who lights up my life, the mixtress DC Gina. <laughs> I love that song. I want to uh, sing it. My my voice is terrible. Hello, Louise. What a good introduction. Hi, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, for the both of us, we're better off for our listeners' sake to sing inside our heads. <laughs> uh, you know, a couple of drinks and who knows what I'm going to say, right? Or who saying knows? or do. Who knows? So I want to shine the light on the humble candle. You know, today we don't think much of it. Uh, we give n- very little thought to the humble candle. We might kick ourselves in the ass when we can't find the extra candles, when the power goes out, or we want to set that perfect spa setting or that romantic dinner. But beyond that, we really don't think much of it. Or I'm assuming we don't, because I know I don't. But the simple candle has literally lit the way for mankind. You like all these puns? I really layered it yeah, in. Yeah, I do. I love it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's thick today. It's thick today. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> the ancient Greeks used candles to honor um, the birth of their goddess Artemis on the sixth day of every lunar month. And the Romans, well, they began dipping candles way back in 500 BCE um, from rendered animal fat, which sounds pretty damn gross, but that's how candles were made for many, many years. Um, And then I got to ask you this, Gina, have you ever heard of a candlefish? No. What's that? So it's actually, uh, uh, it's called a eulicon, a eulicon fish, I believe. And it gets its nickname as a candlefish because it has such a high fat content that you can dry it and literally set that poor bitch on fire. It is a candle. Oh my gosh. I didn't know that. See? I mean, now I would like to know about that. It must so smell that's god awful. <clears throat> one would think. One would think that's got to be like terrible. Yeah. But Ugh. you know, I guess it's better to see in you know in the dark what's coming than deal with the stinky smell. I would assume. You know. So, <clears throat> and do you know that if you know Gina, that. if you Gina were a candle maker, yeah. yes. you would be a, a chandelier. I'd be the baker. I'd be the baker, <laughs> and I'd be the pie maker. Um, yeah. But actually. Sorry. The word for that is comes from the old French word chandelier. Oh, there you well, go. That's nice. So ooh la la, yeah. That's very. That's why they're oui, so pretty. Oui. They're female. <laughs> I like that. That's actually really good. So I just want to know, Gina, did I enlighten you with all my candle knowledge? You did enlighten me. I, I'm feeling pretty excited about this now. I just hope that all those puns laid in there really thick help. So. Speaking of those who embrace the many meanings of getting lit, please welcome to the show a man after my own heart, the host of the Jewish drinking show, Rabbi Drew. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise. You Thank like you. that? You like how I set that up? Good. Be, That's great. You That's are, a great you setup. Are, you're like the candle of the of the designated drinker show. You are the candle. <laughs> lighting the way. Lighting the way. I like I love the pun. I mean, it's yeah. fabulous. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know. Again, Gina, I drink, stay up late and drink a lot. So that's where all that comes from. <laughs> yeah, I think I have to catch up. <laughs> yeah. Googling, drinking, late. Those are the three. Re- that's the recipe to those to those intros, just so That's when the knows. best Googling happen- happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's when you, you fall get down to the some of those sites and you're like, I did not mean that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but since I'm here, let me look further and see what yes. happens. <laughs> so, Drew, I have to ask you. Yes. What takes what makes someone a rabbi? What I need to know cuz obviously, well, maybe not. I am not Jewish, so I don't really understand a whole lot. Yep. Um, I'm a blank canvas. Tell me, how does one become a rabbi? Well, it's a great question, Louise. So, it there there are multiple years involved in study, and there's a, let's say a half dozen, maybe a dozen rabbinical schools in our country of America, and different schools have different standards of study, and so some of them have a greater emphasis on one piece of Jewish. I don't know anything. Are you a saying of, that I would need a school with low standards? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But usually they all require at least a bachelor's <laughs> degree for entry. And then where I attended school, it was it was a four or five year it was four or five year uh, schooling. And then we had a heavy focus on 
on Jewish law, right? Really, that was the core of what we studied. We also did some Bible. We did some public speaking. There are other aspects, pastoral counseling, but every school differs one from the next as far as curriculum. Yeah. So why law then? Why law? As advising. So I went to a modern Orthodox rabbinical school. So it may not be so common with a a more liberal, like a reform rabbinical school, but with the Orthodox, they always are so heavily focused on Jewish law, adjudicating Jewish law, various matters, uh, various things threat throughout the day, they can get questions from congregants and also just knowing how to accord oneself uh, living Jewishly and and advising others how to do so. Oh, interesting. Living Jewishly. That's (laughs) interesting. Yeah. (laughs) There's so much to learn. Um, So Gina, but living, growing up in New York, I mean, oh, I almost spilled my drink. I was foul right out of the gate. Uh, I I got, I got rabbi here. He's going to love this story. You want a story, rabbi? Let's yeah. do it. So I grew up in Long Island. Mm-hmm. My mother worked at the Jewish Community Center of West Hempstead. Oh, wow. I went to Hebrew school for the first few years of my schooling. <laughs> then my parents decided it was time for me to go to Catholic school and, and, and start the rest of my school. Yeah. And I really was very confused because I didn't understand what was going on anymore. So I grew <laughs> up. I grew up in a house where my mother literally, you know, she went to the temple and she worked there every day. And that's where I went to school. And my brothers and sisters are older than me. I came eight years after my my, um, closest in age sibling. So they were not any time or near with me in school. So this is what I did. And then I wound up, um, I wound up. Uh, going to Catholic school and, you know, living my, my New York life and, you know, didn't really think anything of it, you know, like it was, everybody has this education. Everybody understands what it's like to, you know, be uh, in an Italian Jewish neighborhood or go to Hebrew school and then you meet other people from, you know, other states such as, I don't know, Maryland, where I live now. Or St. Like, Louis. What? Yeah, they're like, what? What are you talking about? And thank God for Potomac. Uh, because at least there, uh, there was a refuge in Rockville with people that understood your life. So I, I <laughs> totally get it. It's, uh, it's my favorite. And, and my, my family is very mixed um, between uh, Jewish and Italian. So we call okay. all of those uh, nieces and nephews pizza bagels. So there you go. Nice. <laughs> yeah. It's a nice culinary <laughs> reference. I mean... It's very similar. The guilt is off the chart in either way. So either way that you, <laughs> right. you're moving in, in this world, it's, it's off the chart. And, um, <laughs> you know, and, and I got to go, but I'll t- talk more about that when I make the cocktail. I got to go to All Israel. Right. And then I'll tell Ooh. you why I picked the wine and stuff I picked for our cocktail today. How long yeah, ago was that trip? 2005, I was there for the uh, um, Maccabee or Maccabia, however you want to say, at games. Yeah. My friend was in the Jewish Olympics, and he made the U.S. team for rugby. So we all said, Ooh. if you make the team, we're all going to go. And we all went. We were there for six weeks. And wow. Six weeks? Yeah. That's well, great. That's how long the games are. They're six weeks. We have four weeks, but it's one week. It's one week and a half to get settled in and everything. And we all went, and we traveled around and went everywhere and forget how to tell a story now. We went everywhere in Israel and it is special. It's not even a word to describe what Israel is. It is, if you ever have a chance to go in your lifetime, you should go because it's, it changes you. It changes. And if you have an ounce of spirituality and that might be in your pinky toe, it will, it will, it doesn't matter what your religion is. It will, um, manifest itself into uh, a better person, really. You know, we went to all the different places and, you know, Caesarea and uh, just traveled. And, you know, I found this place in the, um, the Baha'i Temple and it's beautiful and it's all the religions yeah. that come together and just really magic. And it's the beginning of earth and time. And that's what I, at least I believe that. That's something I've always said, but. That's after I went. I think once you go, you, your opinions, whatever your opinions may be, will change. Hmm. That's a really great take. I like it. Yeah. I think it's interesting. And uh, Rabbi Drew and I were talking earlier um, about, like, for me, um, growing up in the Midwest, not growing up, you know, it, like, honestly, my exposure to Judaism was my mother had one Jewish friend. <laughs> 
Ruth. And 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 it's funny as a child, my my mother didn't go into detail as to why um, that the difference there was it was just her friend Ruth. Um, but I but I what I appreciated was her beautiful home at Christmas time with all the silver and blue, and I thought it was so much better than my mother's tacky multicolored Christmas lights. <laughs> That's yeah. all I took away. I mean, really, honestly, but I had no exposure because growing up in the Midwest, I mean, there is actually a, a larger Jewish community within St. Louis of beautiful Jewish temples. But it's such a segregated city um, that it wasn't anything. And I don't know that there's anything like uh, like you didn't hang out with Jewish kids. It wasn't like that. It was just that it it's just such a segregated city. No, there's not you that weren't exposed meld. to it. Yeah, yeah. And it's sad because all cultures should be exposed to one another. Well, and I think, and I think that breaks down the fact that you just realize, oh, they're just people. They're just people just like me. And they just have different points of view that are similar. Oddly. Oh, Louise, we got to take you to Brooklyn <laughs> and leave you there for a year. You'll be fine. <laughs> so, Drew, what, what started the podcast? Mine was because I just wanted to hang out with Gina and uh, quit my job because I hated being a creative director where I was a creative director. Um, and I really just want to hang out with Gina and drink really great cocktails. That's not totally true. But what made you start your podcast? That's a great reason. That's, that's good enough. So <laughs> I... I'm, I'm going to give a little backstory, which was in November, December 2018. I started realizing I really want to put out my I love texts. I love rabbinic and Jewish texts. That's why I became a rabbi. And I wanted to start writing about them. So in January 2019, I created a, a website about my writings. And then finally, in some point in the summer of 2019, it dawned on me, wait a second. One of the big areas of focus of my writing is on, Jew on drinking. And I said, this is such a lost opportunity to really focus on this. And it really took listening to some Gary Vaynerchuk talks about niching and really developing that niche. So finally, mid-September, I created jewishdrinking.com. And I said, I'm going to have a lot of writings on here. I really want to create this as a space. And uh, I realized if I needed to be serious about this, it needed to have a podcast with guests who could speak knowledgeably to the topic. Now, I will say also what compelled me to write on all those Jewish drinking text was really, I was dissatisfied with the way a lot of various Jewish texts were, were characterized as many times, even something as simple, something, and this is a lot more broad than simply a Jewish text, which is the Noah story of Noah getting drunk in Genesis chapter nine, the very first incident in the entire Bible of anybody drinking and Noah gets drunk. So people had characterized him as, it was like, oh, he got drunk and it's not a good thing. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's, it's actually really ambiguous of a story. So um, that was, that's just one instance. So I think for me, a big push is to, to I don't, for lack of a better term, assert my read of these, of whether stories, other texts, and say it's really not demonized in Jewish texts all that much. And it's a lot more complicated and nuanced. That's interesting. Growing up in, um, in St. Louis, it's, got, it's really close to the Bible Belt. And yep. I have uh, Jehovah's Witnesses in my family. Um, and not that alcohol is frowned upon in Jehovah's Witness, uh, witness for Jehovah's Witnesses, but a lot of in the Bible Belt, it is so demonized to your point. Mm -hmm. And there it is way back in the book. I mean, it, like, that's the Old Testament. It starts there with Noah. That's, yep. that's interesting. Yeah. So I, now, as of the time of this recording, I just published my 53rd episode this morning. So I, I've passed the, the half hundred mark and there's still so much. Congratulations. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So there's still cheers so much. Cheers to that way, man. You, you've already poured a little shot there, right? Yeah. I'm yes. finishing cheers. the shot of bourbon. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. cheers. L'chaim. 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 So, and there's still so much to explore. I know that even only over 50 episodes, there's, I, I feel like I barely scratched the surface. There's still so much to explore and whether that's rabbinic text, biblical stuff, a huge area has actually been historical and surprisingly even archeological stuff, which with finding wine residue, it's really fascinating. Um, I can lot believe to explore. that. Yeah, a lot to explore because alcohol has been part of human culture for thousands and thousands of years. And it's in the Bible, it's in throughout all of human history. So it's, there's a lot to explore. Well, it was safer to drink the wine than it was the water. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. In the Middle Ages, beer in Europe, beer was a lot cheaper than wine, so people drink that. Well, if you live in current Europe now, it's cheaper to drink wine and beer than it is to drink water, usually. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Well, they talk about that, like, um, you know, know, speaking about that, like, you know, some of the earliest drinks were found in Egypt, right? So they had like the honey and the the mead Mm -hmm. and then became the honeymoon. And that's the honeymoon still tradition. People go on their honeymoon and drink. And after they get married and the whole idea is to really just get pregnant. Right. And mm-hmm. loosen up and get pregnant. But like that one. Literally, did you mean literally loosen up? I mean, come on, Gina. Come on. You know what I mean? It's just a, just an joyous time. And I I think about uh, I'm telling. I, listen, if everyone's listening to this, you need to go to this part of the world because it's amazing. But the ancient art of drinking or that is. You know, I never thought about the Bible like that. And I took um, Bible study for uh, two, uh, two years in college as my English class. And, you know, obviously all we did was the Old Testament. And, you know, I was more into like the book of Job and stuff and how, you know, God had a sense of humor and made a deal <laughs> with the devil and said, let's see how far we can punish this person and see, will he still love me over you? And, yeah. you know, and that was, that was amazing. But like, it didn't ever occur to me, like, yeah, you read I read those things and I've never put that together. Well, that's the funny thing is a lot of people have read the Bible and they, they skip the drinking parts. Even for someone who's read the book of Job, he there early on in like the first chapter, Job throws a drinking party and Mishta, they have a drinking party and he has to like atone for this, right? There's drinking at the very first chapter of the book of Job. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm listening, I'm listening to you say this. I'm like, no. And then I'm like, Oh my gosh, there really is. And I yeah. never even, I never even picked up on it. And I, and when I was in college, obviously I was definitely, uh, drinking. I, I wasn't drink. I was drinking, but not like that. And I also <laughs> was, a, you know, a parent pleaser. I wanted to make sure I was pleasing. Every, I mean, I, I, I skipped over those portions of, you know, trying to put it together at that point in my life. I was, how do I get the A? Am I going to get the A? Okay. I need to know all these facts. Yeah. And now I'm like, I'm starting to like funnel, like flip the pages as you're talking. And I'm like, oh my God, like I, I missed it. I, I missed the one thing and, that really would have identified it for me. Right. And, and one of the things that transcends religion is people reading the Bible, re- reading rabbinic literature, any, any of these literatures, they sort of skip over the drinking stuff. Like it's not part of what they, they're not there for the drinking stuff. So they just sort of skip over it, but it's there under hiding in plain sight under people's noses. It's surprising. Do you think, is that... Robert, do you think that's an American point of view? No. Because we are, nope. oh, okay, because I was just wondering, nope. because it's it, it, America and its Puritan views and, you know, some of the things, you know, coming off right. the Mayflower, those th- those things still, you know, stick. Um, right. I was just wondering if maybe that was. It's even transcends, American. it even transcends that. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you, yeah, transcends border. I'll give you one instance. So one of the earliest rabbinic, text called the Mishnah. It's, it's voluminous. It's pretty large. And the, in the very first text, you, I think you'll love this. There's a famous rabbi in the late first century of the common era. So the temple's laying in ruins that, and he's this great leader. His name is Rabban Gamliel. So it says his sons come in after midnight and they come in, they had been out drinking. It literally says they were out at a drinking house. They were out drinking and they said, oh, we didn't, we didn't say this prayer. And he said, no, 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 it's okay. You have until the sun rises to to say this prayer. In the very first rabbinic text, right there, his sons come home. They've been out drinking late. You're like, say that. You can say it with the slur. By the way, no one is out drinking early. It's obviously after midnight that they come home. And you can tell they're kind of young. They're like probably 18, 20, and he's waiting for them. Like, so... It's right there, but most people who even study these, like really they're serious, they don't even realize this text is right there under their noses. So it's not just the people who study the Bible, such as Job. It's it's there in all these texts. It's, it's incredible. Do you have a reason, do you have an, uh, a theory as to why that is? I, oh man, I'm going to float one theory out. We'll see how, how, it, how it lands, which is I, I think the Bible rabbinic literature of the the early handful of centuries of the common era all these like drinking was a part of life 
it, it wasn't crazy. It wasn't separate. It was, it was there. It was part of life. And now we've gotten to this place where, and it, it could be more of the 20th, early 21st century contemporary, like whatever's going on, where drinking hasn't really been so much of a focus and we don't really think about it back then. But in their own context, drinking was just a part of life. Yeah. And, and even such a, something as, as the Passover Seder, like what's going on with the Passover Seder? I know we're supposed to be talking about Hanukkah, but I'm going to skip yeah. ahead to Passover. So we have the four cups of wine and there's a certain order to it. That's why it's called the Seder, which in Hebrew means order. We have these four cups of wine, but it's really largely modeled off, or, off of a Roman symposium or a Latin convivium. They have a certain order oh. to the way that they're, they're drinking their wine. Oh, and that's so it's interesting. All of life. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So, uh, Gina, you know how my business partner, you know, he, I was telling Drew, he introduced me to Seder. I had no idea. And it was just only in the last five years of my life, probably four, three years of my life that, um, you know, my husband Dave and I go and it's, it, and I have no idea what to anticipate. I have no idea. Um, but then he has, um, his daughter's, um, books from Hebrew school and they're really they're elementary but it's perfect for me right like I'm like I, I don't know anything <laughs> but it was it was it, it was really great to have somebody to introduce me to and without without any like predisposed anything it was just like please enjoy this wonderful dinner which has a greater meaning and here's what it means and to be able to be a part of that for me it was really beautiful to be a part of part of a family meal that um I at, in the beginning I'm like we're going to eat raw ho- horseradish really and then <laughs> but you know now i'm like three years in i don't mind it on a little bit of a cracker you know it's not too bad <laughs> of course i'm Did, down uh, in the wine so who knows <laughs> but it's classic when you have a, a classic uh, person that doesn't uh, go to go to say about with at people's houses they open the book to the wrong way and then you're and you start <laughs> laughing you're like obviously it's your first one yeah so that, that's in that's that's your way that they you know they hone you in. Every but every family the has good a thing is, in front of you. <laughs> the good thing is they let us do that. They they told us right off the bat. It's I'm like, are we Japanese? Okay, you know, I, I'm Japanese, Jewish, also the same letter. I don't know, uh, but no. So we and then uh, and it's kind of fun because they have like toys that you throw at like you know when the with each plague there's frogs and like it's so yeah. it's it's really it was um, a fun way to be introduced to a um, obviously something that has greater cultural meaning, but allowing somebody who is. Um, just feel uh, it's approachable and it, it made it a really fun night and let's be honest we were all really we had to uber home <laughs> that's great <laughs> it's not it's not a night of it's not it's not a night of sobriety that's no not. no <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a four cup of wine minimum <laughs> exactly minimum yeah. <laughs> yeah. so rabbi i have a question yeah. So when you're doing the podcast, and I'm going to start listening to it because I totally love the, the biblical stories. Awesome. Do you think that this is a way or a good way to like to bring the younger, you know, fa- like Jewish kids in the family, like back to, you know, identify with the Bible or identify with their roots or anybody to identify with, you know, their religion and maybe go back to it and, and you know, and become you know, be like, oh, well, I do these things too. No, it's not wrong to enjoy your life, but there is a spiritual meaning to life. And these, I mean, that's gotta be a way like that you're getting to that point, right? I have, I've not listened to your podcast yet. So that's I'm fine. wondering, is that, go ahead. So it, it, it could very well be, maybe. I'm, I'm not, like the objective really, to be honest, is not to necessarily draw people to religion or back to religion or anything of that sort. If they happen to be great, I'm not I'm not there to discourage that. That's, that's wonderful. It's, However, it can be beneficial to them. I, I do like really, to be honest, like my main thrust is to within the Jewish discourse to think about whether it's a biblical text or rabbinic text or anything else or reads of history to think about it, not as in any way demonizing. I, I think it's to really have a good sense of what, what are the texts really actually trying to say and not with a sort of negative uh, cover over it. Right. Well, that's yeah. cool. I mean, I just yeah. find it, I find it fascinating that you're doing this. Like, now I want to like go back and be like, I missed it. I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna listen to your shows. I'm like, Thank you know, you. what that's that's amazing. So Thank tell you. And, me. And, it's, and also, I will say with the biblical stuff is that one of the great things about the biblical stuff and it has. I mean, I've had non-Jewish like professors on to talk about various biblical things. I've had at least three as out of the fifty-three so far. I need to do more biblical stuff. 
But it, so it's not necessarily Jewish specific. If any, there are a lot of Bible readers in the entire world. So I think it can definitely provide a lot of enlightenment on it. So it's not necessarily just about the Jewish aspect. It's anybody interested in the biblical stuff. Well, I love that. So from, are from, all a, of your... from a drinking perspective. Yeah. So, so do you so make do... a drink on your, hold on. Do you make a drink on your show? I should. I really haven't. That really hasn't been a focus. Oftentimes, especially if I'm recording in the evenings, I'll encourage people to grab a beer, whiskey, whatever, or wine, whatever they're interested in. But sometimes it's, you know, not really. I, I see a guest star opportunity here. I'm just saying, Great. I see it happening. Great. I see it happening. Great. I mean, I have, I have had, uh, I will say, like, once I had someone from Israel who was really into the craft cocktail scene in Israel. So he created, he designed a cocktail specifically for a specific calendrical event uh, for something that happened. So, but yeah, I mean, that's something I could, you know, do in the future. Oh, I, I like that. Yeah. Do you, well, do you guys want a cocktail or do you want to? Well, I'm thinking while you're talking about it, Gina, you brought it up. I mean, I did bring it up. It's crazy, <laughs> right? Um, um, okay, so I thought about it and I was like, how can I incorporate something that's kosher into making a cocktail and then started looking at all of my different liquors and I realized that most liquor doesn't have a kosher symbol on it except for wine. Wine has kosher symbols. So I guess my first question is this, is art, is liquor kosher or not? Oh, that's a great question. So the question of kosher is definitely something that pops up frequently with alcoholic beverages. And uh, I will say this, whiskeys are the easiest things to consider. Okay. Um, especially scotches are, I don't know. I will say whiskeys are kind of on the easier side when it comes to liqueurs that could, basically one of the weirdest things when it comes to kosher is the potential for wine or grapes to be involved. And that makes things sketchy. I'll just say that. It, it, it's a whole other ball of wax. Um, okay, good. Well, then but, I, did, uh, I did the right thing there. <laughs> yes, yes. I, otherwise, I would have pushed back on the recipe. So I have everything that we need for this cocktail. Okay, so, all right. So this is my So that our listeners to... know, he, so our listeners know, because we're in COVID, and, you know, typically, if you've been a longtime listener, you would know that we, we would belly up to Gina's bar, and we'd have fun conversation, and Gina would make us a cocktail. In the COVID land, we're doing it differently. We're obviously, we're recording in all our own, you know, spaces. We're doing it um, via Zoom. And each one of our guests are asked to make the cocktail. So they actually get a little, they get a sneak preview of what Gina is going to um, create on each episode. So Drew got the recipe early on. So that makes sure that he had all the, all the, all the ingredients that was needed to make this cocktail. Which I totally love. It's a, uh, um, so now. Here's, I want to just push this down just a little bit. Okay. So the reason why I said my trip to Israel, so I got, so this is a, um, a, like a, just a dry red wine. Um, it's from, it's the grape is Samsum and it's from Caesarea and it's Valencia. So Caesarea is a very, it, it's a Roman city in Israel and it looks like maybe, right? Am I correct? If you correct me if I'm wrong, um, Rabbi Drew, if I mess this up. So there's a bunch of, you know, vineyards, or not vineyards, grapes, grapes and and wineries. They, they grow the grapes, you know, out more in, um, in the, de and it's so bizarre, in the desert, desert farms, and they irrigate them and grow the grapes, but the grapes are from Israel, which I find to be amazing. So it's like a new way of producing grapes in the desert using the new um, aquaculture and, I wanted to make sure that we had something about it. Well, if you drink kosher wine, and this is a this is a big gamble because I got it from Israel, the year to year is very, very different. Whereas you can get some French wines that are kosher and you can get, um, you know, some Italian wines and things like that. So I, I made sure that it had the K on it, but I think this is actually pretty lovely. We already opened a bottle of it and I would 100% say this is something to get and try it, right? So we're making a New York sour and a New York sour is literally a whiskey sour with a wine float. And it needs to be something that is, is a little bit, um, you know, a little, a little, a little um, bitchy, if you will. It needs to have a wine that's a little stank on it. So a Cabernet would be really lovely. Do not use a Pinot Noir. 
because it's a little too sweet. Um, you know, an, an Alianico from uh, Italy would be wonderful. The idea of using the wine on the cocktail really came from the bartender having leftover wine and to not waste it, they put it in the drink because the nice. whiskey sour, you basically only taste the whiskey sour, right? So what you need to do is get out a shaker and I'm using, so I, I was looking for something blue and I found this at my aunt's house. And I don't know if you've ever seen one, but I, it's my first time ever being allowed to use uh, a real old school Tiffany shaker. Wow. And, I'm, and I'm using it and I want to show you this because this is a very old classic. Um, Napier was a, a, was a jewelry designer as well as Tiffany and company. But the top, it doesn't come off. It's stuck there. And when you pour, you release it and the drink comes out. And I wanted to use this because obviously Tiffany and all of that is really lovely, but also the fact that, um, you know, we're gonna honor Hanukkah. So you do take out your best, your best to make the cocktail, right? Yeah. Right. I think so. All right, so let's start and we'll do this together. I think I'm going, to, I think you can see. So I'm actually not gonna get up, I'll get up to shake. Um, I lied, I'm getting up, I already lied to you. I'm already, I'm do already need, lying to a rabbi. Do we need ice? Do we need you, ice you, for this? You, Yes. You will need ice for this. You're going to need ice two times. Once for, well, this drink can be served up in a chilled glass or this can be served on the rocks. It is really up to you. I use rocks for this drink because 100% this is a tough drink to uh, make happen. And I want to show you this new thing that came out this year. Um, not this year, maybe it came out last year. Uh, but I, I happened to um, bring it along. Because if you're going to give a gift and anybody's looking to give somebody a gift and it's something inexpensive and you want to give your favorite cocktail uh, geek a, a, a gift for Hanukkah and you have to give seven, you know, you have to give all uh, eight days a small gift. This is the new thing. So this is, you see it, it's, um, it's a big styrofoam and it's from Tovolo and it's an Italian uh, made ice maker that makes ice beers. Now, it's been sitting out, you have to forgive me, it's been sitting out a little bit in the uh, heat here. I am in Florida right now. Um, so we're gonna take it out, I'm taking it out. And once you take off the shell, it, you have these little discs and then you pop them off. I'm trying not to get water everywhere, but I'm going to. Well, it's a good thing is you're out on the lanai, so it won't, it won't matter. I know, I'm, I'm like Blanche Devereaux over here, that's right. Um, <laughs> All right, so let's see if this actually works. And we might have gotten only half, but it, either way, it doesn't matter. You have your ice cube that you need for your glass. So you take so off the I top. Just, I just bought um, spheres from um, Amazon as well. Too. Which brand did you get? I didn't get something quite as fancy as you. This is just those are the, better. I'm going to tell you right now, they are better. These are kitchen so planet. It. So if you see them, but yours they're pretty are pretty um, good. They melted a little bit because it's a little hot. So oh, see, those are cute. Yeah, exactly, right? So if you want to make them more special and make them more round, basically what you would do is run them under um, hot water or warm water, and uh, or just really tepid water, I should say. Don't, don't not hot water. So this is a little odd because it's not coming off that well. So maybe this is not the best thing to show you, but I'm showing it to you. So don't buy this for anybody. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> there you go. I popped it out and now you have it. And we're going to do one more because I'm making three drinks because I have thirsty family members that are looking at me like, this is taking a long time to get to this part of the show. Um, <laughs> so we're going to dump this over. And you can do this ahead of time and you, and you really should. I just wanted to show you that... It actually looks really nice. It looks great in the glass. You see that? It's clear. Yeah. And it's really quite lovely. Mine's not All right, clear because so. I didn't put hot water, but. No, 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 no. That's actually not the trick. You actually don't want to put um, hot water. If you really want clear ice, you need to use distilled water. And you take the distilled water and you um, use that and you'll get really beautiful clear ice. And it's, and it's gotcha. really nice. Um, I'm sorry, I'm standing up. I'll move that. See, I realize what you say. Okay, so I have a lot of water on my cutting board, which I love. Um, all right, so we're gonna take our shaker tin and we are going to add in there. I'm, like, I'm making three cocktails, but if you're making this just for you and your loved one, um, you're gonna put, I believe I put two ounces on your recipes, yes? I hope I did, did I? Louise? Sure. 
Yes. Did, okay. I can't yeah. see it now. I'm going to say yes. Yeah. Two ounces. Yes. Yeah, so two ounces of, of whiskey. And I'm using Sazerac rye. You can use bourbon, um, whatever you'd like on this. I can use a Japanese whiskey if you want. It's up. To, it's really up to you. And then, sorry, one more. It's three. Okay. So now here comes the trick of doing it. So you ready to put your whiskey in. The next thing that you want to put in when you're making a whiskey a sour is generally is your simple syrup. So your simple syrup is subjective to what you really like, right? Some people like a half an ounce, an ounce. Um, we're going to just do proper portion and we're going to add that one ounce. So it's one at one to two, one to two. Then. So it's, yeah. So it's basically a two to one ratio. A two to one. And then again, we're going to do that with lemons again with, with fresh lemon. And I'm just going to do this um, and squeeze it right here. And you want to add one ounce of lemon juice. So if you really think about what a sours is, it's really a very strong lemonade because you're not putting any water in this, right? Because you're going to shake it. And when you're making a sour and you wanted to make this just a sour and you were going to you know, do that, you could add an egg white to this, shake the cocktail, dry shake, or, um, uh, uh, sorry, dry shake, add a little bit of uh, egg white and serve it up, serve it on ice and then add a little bit of soda water and that would make a, you know, a, a traditional sours. But we are going to use the wine float in this. So you do not add soda water to this drink. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. And if it doesn't make sense really? to any of our listeners, it's okay. Because you're going to go where, yeah. Gina? Where are they going to go get the recipe? You're going to to Designated Drink or Not Show. Wait, what? To te- you're going to go to Designated Drink or Not Show for our tips and tricks and how-tos and um, secret places to buy ice molds that work better than this one, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. So we're going to do, I'm again making two cocktails. So excuse me for the time that it's taking me to do this. And we're going to squeeze one more lemon in there. Rabbi, do you have everything in the glass? Yes. Your shaker? Okay. Sorry, everyone's being so quiet today. I'm not used to that. All right, so I'm almost at my last lemon and we're gonna add some ice to your shaker tin, three quarters full. And then we're gonna, and then we're gonna shake, pour this over, and then I'll show you the trick for getting your wine to float on top of your cocktail, or it might be right. terrible and it won't float. All right. Okay. Oh boy, Shake until it's frosty. Though. Yeah, I will. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Let me see your shaker ten. It's frosty. Great. Perfect. All right. So I'm gonna make sure that. Like that? Okay. All right, I'm going to pour it. Oh, it looks, it's so, this is so pretty. I've never, I'm telling you, I've never used this, uh, this before and it's so gorgeous. Okay, so you're going to take your spoon. See this part? Put it this yes. way. Okay, and you're going to pour it over, the, let me make some room here. So for our listeners, when she says this way, she means turn your spoon upside down. So it's. So upside, um, what is it called? Your con, your convex side. So it's sticking yes. out. Yeah. Sorry, I had to get to that <laughs> part, okay? So now you're gonna take your spoon and you're gonna pour it over the top and you're gonna rest it. Of the spoon. So it floats. Oh, it makes a mess. It shouldn't. It should just go right to the top. It did. And, it did, but okay, I, good. I don't know what I did wrong. It just went all over my counter, but it's fine. It, it is floating though, look. I totally made it float. I'm very excited. And, um, you know, here's really something really funny. Uh, you should use, like I said, something that is actually good to drink. Because <laughs> when you make this with um, a wine that's kind of gross, it's cr- <laughs> it makes the drink kind of gross. I would imagine. All right. Right on top. All right. So. Let's see. Let's, let's judge see. them. Let's see it. What you got, yeah. Rabbi Drew? So I, I didn't pay attention to all the directions. I just put the wine in with everything else, but it's here. Amazing. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> It should still taste the same, right? (laughs) It goes the same place. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. All right. Well, cheers. You shall atone to that. Okay, everyone, cheers. Smile. Cheers. (laughs) All right. I love it. Yeah. 
Oh, that's mm. good. Oh, yeah. the wine kind of rounds it out, though. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it really rounds out the drink. That's really interesting. And it, and it like takes off takes off the sourness a little bit too. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. the what um, what kind of wine did you use? A Merlot. That was just what I had open. Perfect. Yep. Yep. Oh, that is That's okay. Literally, yeah, of course. Oh, good. Just, Yay. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't want to put something that's too like very forward. It'll make the drink, you know, it's supposed to be a dry drink. You know, you're supposed to, uh, you know, drink it. It's a little bit long. You sip it. It's, you know, it's supposed to last a little while. It shouldn't be like something you just guzzle. Like I find that sometimes I make a very strong drink. Why are you I judging me, Gina? Why are you judging me? <laughs> what? Why are you you should me? love this drink, Louise. You love margaritas and like the dryness. So this should be like right up your alley. It is. Yeah. This is right up my alley because I'm, I'm not a typical whiskey drinker. It's not my it's not my mm. go to spirit. And this for me rounds it out. I really enjoy. Um, I like the um, I like the wine. I, I like what wine is doing to the to the with the lemon. Like it's very yeah. interesting. It's yeah. almost like a sangria. It almost drinks like a sangria, but far more interesting. And the whiskey gives it a different complexity. So I, I react. It, this is right up my alley, surprisingly. Yeah, I, this is super cool. I don't usually put wine in my mixed drinks, so this is really neat yeah. to also have that dryness with the sour. And I threw in a rye, so with the little intense spice too. It's cool. Which rye did you use? New Riff, the rye. Oh, I've never. You know what? I've never had that. So they're less than a decade old, and they're my they're my guests for next week's episode. So I happen to have some lying around. <laughs> awesome. Is it kosher? Yeah. <laughs> um, so they, so it's actually a Jewishly owned distillery in Northern Kentucky, and what? they, um, yeah, and they actually have sold their their chametz for Pesach the last couple of years. Their whiskeys last last two Passovers, they've sold their whiskeys because whiskey is a problem for Passover. Oh, yes, that is absolutely true. So yeah. it's interesting when, for for research for the show. Of course, yeah. Al was sending me all these notes. And making sure, and I'm like, yeah, he's giving me all these notes. But it was really interesting that there, what I did get is an article that was about, um, there's a rabbi, and he's like, Louise, if this could have been, if somebody would have told me when I was 12 years old, this could be my job. And he, he's a <laughs> rabbi, and he goes, and he makes, he helps different distilleries, I guess, make sure their wine is kosher, or their their whiskey is kosher. That was my last week episode. Oh, there you go. There you I go. had him on. He's in Kentucky. He's in Louisville. <laughs> Yeah, Rabbi yeah. Chaim Lipin. Yeah, the bourbon rabbi. He is the bourbon yes. rabbi. He, you did yeah. send that to me, and I didn't listen to that. I just went off to other ones and just started listening to all different that, ones. <laughs> that's why Hal sent it to you. <laughs> you didn't. Do, I didn't do what you told me to do. I just did the other ones. <laughs> yeah, Wait a minute. He's the bourbon rabbi. This is like the yeah. greatest thing ever. I yeah, would like yes. to. I would They're like to be at- the bourbon shiksa. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he he goes to different distilleries in Kentucky, makes sure they're kosher. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, the Wall Street Journal did a 2017 article on him. That's how he got apparently the name Bourbon Rabbi. And now he he has his bourbonrabbi.com website. He started put out, he's put out one label. I think this coming spring he's going to put out a second bourbon label. Uh, so, yeah. He's a he's a relatively wow. young man, right? I mean, he seemed yeah, young. 30s. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think he's in his 30s. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. That's cool. That. That's really cool. Yeah, that's why Hal's like, Louise, I'd never be doing these podcast stuff with you if I knew I could have done this. <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty well, fun, though. So I don't know what he's talking about. Well, <laughs> you notice he's not on this show, though. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, too much. So um, how do you... So it's funny. It's like, so when I originally asked Rabbi Drew to be on the show, of course it was the, from the joke, but I mean, not the joke, but I mean, um, I asked about Hanukkah. I'm like, let's talk about Hanukkah. And he's like, well, if you want to, but so <laughs> we can, we can still knock that out. <laughs> but it was, it was just kind of funny because as a non-Jewish person, I mean, like Hanukkah is something I'm supposed to know about. Like I'm supposed to acknowledge and understand, right? Like sure. it's just to be respectful, but it, you just, told, it's, it's not, it's not necessarily all that the rest of us, I mean, it's important, but. Right. It's there. It's not a major holiday. As far as the Jewish tradition goes, it's, it's there. We have our major holidays and it's, it's a nice commemorative winter celebration and sort of the dark 
you know, sort of the darkest days of the year in which we, going back to your, your trivia at the head of the show, we have lights, right? We, for eight nights, we, we light lights and it's, it's nice. It's <laughs> right. It's nice. It's and nice. <laughs> and it's nice. We light, we light the lights and there's some additional sort of fest, festiveness around the holiday. There's and, lockers. That's that, important. Right, right. So I'll say this in the more religious aspects of it, there's a little bit extra that we would insert into our prayers, maybe a little bit extra, but on the religious level, there's nothing really that much more on the sort of the practical part of it. There's also the consumptive aspects and there's a lot of oily goodness that comes along with it. Latkes, donuts, other, I don't know. Oil, I, I, I was about to ask, I was about to ask Gina, like, are there cocktails with that have oil in them? So maybe you could incorporate It'd be a, a Hanukkah uh, cocktail ooh. with olive oil. I don't know. Yes. Uh, oh, Gina, Absolutely. what about those, those dirty oh. martinis we had up at Dante's that they topped yeah. with the truffle oil? Yeah, mm. we oh. can do that. Done. Wow. Well, let's, uh, <laughs> I, I, you can share that on your website. I'll give you one for sure. Yes, like, um, happily. Yeah, so you just, you just basically do your, your martinis and then you um, infuse, you infuse oil with things that you want it to taste like. So if you are, you know, you love, I don't know, oregano and um, pearl onion and I don't know, and salt. You'll put it into your, your <laughs> olive oil, let it sit for like 24 to 48 hours. And then you take an eyedropper and you drop it on the top of your drink after you've made it, after it's cold, everything, you drop it on top. <laughs> and then as you, instead of a garnish, you get that little, little flavor of olive oil. It's very delicious. And you have to use particular gins or particular vodkas be only because it has to be able to carry the weight of something so heavy, wow. but delicious nonetheless. Wow. It's like a meal. So you really don't have to serve anything else. You're like, well, we're going to have martinis and eventually <laughs> we'll get to the lock of the lock of course and maybe, and maybe a jelly donut. <laughs> well, I don't Jenny, know. You, you make your, your um, bloody Mary's with the bagel and the locks on top. Could you not do like a dirty martini with a little latka on top? Could you not? Could you do that? Of course. Our new our new thing now is we put lakas in our bagel sandwiches, so you can get like an <laughs> egg and cheese and laka. So, so you that's get carbs on top of the, the carbs. That sounds really carbs, tasty, uh, though. Carbs on. So your we carbs? call it we call it uh, Rabbi. We call it laka shatter. Ooh. Yeah. So we take the laka and we um, press it down, so it's not quite as thick as a regular laka. It's a little bit crispier, and then we put it on top of your in, in the middle of your sandwich as almost a crisp. It's really nice. Ooh. It's different. Is that kind of know? like putting potato but, chips on your sandwich you, then? Yes. That's exactly what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, really. It's the crunch. I don't know. Yes, that's it's great. delicious. It's a little soft, a little crunchy. I'm uh, getting hungry for I, that right now. <laughs> that's kind of like you and me, you know, a little soft, a little crunchy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Little salty at times. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, Louise, is it time for my question yet? I feel like it is. No, it isn't because we're gonna do our we're gonna do our housekeeping one more time. Where are they gonna go to get okay. your recipe? They're gonna go to designated drinker dot show. And Wait, where? There you have where? To where? Designated where? drinker dot show. And what happens? And you'll get my tips, tricks, how tos, and how to get in touch with Rabbi Drew and Jewish drinking and yep. all of those things. And I guess now we're sharing a locker recipe, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, why, why so for our listeners yeah. like normal, of course, you go to designatedrinker.show to get everything that we offer up on the show. But of course, to get a hold of, um, find out what um, Rabbi Drew is doing, get, make sure you get to the Jewish drinking show. Um, we definitely have all of that there on our website. But the other thing we'll also do is if you go to the episode notes, you'll find all of that there too as well. So, um, yes. So you'll get all the links. You don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to think about anything. Just drink. We'll have it there for you um, when, you, when you're ready. <laughs> all right, now, you Gina. Have, you have the drinks and the links. That's the important part. Oh, That's I love right. it. We've never done that. Drinks and links. <laughs> <laughs> That's so smart. <laughs> there you go. I mean, that's the show closer right there. I love that. All right. So, <laughs> Rabbi. Yeah. So, in this day and age, you have all these people that, you know, identify themselves with different, you know, uh, their spiritual animal. And they're like, I really identify myself with, you know, a Floridian tree fog because I'm able to survive in different climates and, you know, whatever. You have like some kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. If you can identify yourself as a spirited ingredient, 
what would it be and why? Ooh, I'm not, I'm not super fancy. I probably would do something simple as, can I say bourbon? Is bourbon okay? Yeah. Like it. It's straightforward. It's there. You know what to do with it. And it's still packs good flavor. <laughs> Perfect answer. Thank I you. love that. A little aged. <laughs> A little aged. That's right. A little aged, but still it packs some freshness too. Like it's, you know. <laughs> it's timeless. That's amazing. That's a good answer. Thank Very you. good Thanks. answer. All right. On that All note, right. folks, I think it's time to wrap. Cheers. Cheers. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you. Happy Hanukkah. Yeah. And nice to meet you, Rabbi Drew. It was really nice to meet you. (laughs) Nice to meet you as well, Drew. The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a podcast media company dedicated to connecting people to intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Missing Link is a proud partner of Hearing Charities of America, a nonprofit organization that supports those who are deaf or hard of hearing. To learn more about HCOA or to find out about Missing Link's other podcasts, head over to missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company. Missing Link.